joy in your presence with the eternal pleasures at your right hand. For you have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Then people will say, Surely the righteous still are rewarded. Surely there is a God who judges the earth. You are my strength. I sing praise to you. Your God are my fortress, my God on whom I can rely. With God we will gain the victory, and he will trample down our enemies. So be it. start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. Lord, we thank you for this rain that you pour out upon the land, Lord. We pray for those that are still suffering in wildfires and smoke and everything. Lord, we just thank you for the relief that you bring us, that you've created this world and you've left us to be stewards over it, Lord. Help us as a church especially to be stewards and to tell of the words of Jesus Christ, the good news. We just thank you and praise you that you have poured out your spirit that we are your children, Lord, and speak to us today through your Spirit. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this, The, so the Promise of God. And if you remember last week, I talked about that there were six miktam uh, psalms in the Bible that David wrote. Did you find out what they were? Merle read from them. At least you're honest, Barry. Merle read from them today. He read the last verse of each of those five. David wrote all of them. We don't know exactly what that word means, but Walt can tell you more, and hopefully will, he will in the Sunday school class because he studies Hebrew and, and everything. But there's root parts of that word, even though we don't know totally what the word means, but gold's involved. Engraving is involved. A blood... Stain is involved. Sounds like Jesus to me and the Holy Spirit writing the mysteries of God on your heart. Something that's much more precious than silver or gold or anything else. And each of those psalms start out with trouble in this world. But they end with victory in Jesus. So I just took the last one of each of those psalms and put them together and had Merle read them today. And I don't know about you, but it was such a blessing to see... God's triumph, His power, His authority. And I hope you can apply that to you and I in the church. It's not a mystery anymore. God has revealed the mysteries to you and I about reconciliation of mankind to Him. And you are His agent, His ambassador to the world to tell the good news of Jesus Christ. The promise of God. There are so many promises in the Bible if you look, at the, at, look up that topic. But again, I'm focusing on the promise of the Holy Spirit. Because we can live differently than anyone else did before the Holy Spirit came. Even King David. He even wrote, to do not let your Holy Spirit depart from me. We don't have to worry about that. The Holy Spirit will never leave us, never forsake us. He will guide us into all truth. He seals us and gives us a foretaste of what is to come. We are so blessed. And to know that you're going to get the promise, you've got to know that God is faithful. He promised a Messiah. Jesus came. Jesus died for our sins. He promised to write the laws on our hearts. You've been given the Holy Spirit and His laws are written on your heart. He wants to bring about kingdom re restoration. And Jesus said to repent, just like John the Baptist did, for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is at hand. You are part of that process of bringing about total restoration, drawing men back to God. It's not a mystery. It will be revealed to you as you yield to the Spirit. 
So if God is faithful, it reminded me of a song, and Debbie didn't do this one, so I'm glad I get to just give you some of the uh, lyrics. Does it remind you of one? Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I now can see, perfect present cleansing in the blood for me standing in the liberty where Christ makes free standing on the promises of God standing on the promises of Christ the Lord bound to him eternally by love's strong cord overcoming daily by the spirit's sword standing on the promises of God standing on the promises I shall not fall listening every moment to the spirit's call Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. What a wonderful promise, promises that we have. Are you letting the Holy Spirit fill you, use you? You have been called. You have been given authority. And you have been given power. To be witnesses of Jesus Christ, of God's love for mankind, in your community, in your surrounding areas, to the ends of the world. If you deny your calling, <laughs> you can't be used. If you don't think you have the authority, you can't be used. And if you're not tapping into the power, living by the Spirit's calling, the Spirit's sword, knowing that you're, you're taken care of, you're covered no matter what life has, that you can... Shout out blessings to the Lord, because just like each one of those psalms ends with, God is faithful, God is true, there is victory for those who are His children. So we've been looking at Acts, and we're going to look at Acts still again for a little bit. You might call it Acts of the Apostles. You might would call it Acts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and I'll even add, through the most unlikely of men. <laughs> you might call it Acts of the men and women, the children of God. Don't forget that. First thing Peter quotes from is Joel where he says, God says, I'll pour out my spirit and even your women, your slaves, free, everyone will prophesy. They will tell of the knowledge of God, His goodness, His kindness, His love. Or you might call it Acts of the church. That's you and I. Or you could even call it Acts of of the risen Christ, Jesus, our Lord, through us. In Acts 2.36, Peter said, Therefore let all Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That is for certain. Jesus is reigning now. He will come back and reign on this earth. That is certain. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. So are you living as you understand this? Are you living by the Spirit's power? The four Gospels tell us that God has fulfilled His promise of bringing salvation and reconciliation to mankind. And then the, and then the, the book of Acts is a continued story of the works of Jesus Christ through His children with authority, with power. I don't know about you, but I never plug in a drill or anything that's an electrical one, not a battery one. Well, you could do a battery one too, and don't plug it into power. It doesn't really do much, does it? I mean, think about it. Think about just stabbing the hole and trying to drill the hole through the board. Keep it on. You plug it into the power, right? So that it works properly. And then, man, it does the job, doesn't it? The Holy Spirit is the power in the lives of, the, of Christians and in the life of the church. Life abundant life, eternal life. Jesus Himself living in and through us by the power of the Spirit. Growing the kingdom of God until He returns. And if you read on through Acts, you'll see that the ending of Acts is kind of open, kind of left there. 
And I think that's intentional by Luke because we are writing the continued story of Acts, the story of the church. Let me remind you of Jesus' final words in person, not through the Spirit. It is not for you to know the times or season that the Father has fixed by His own authority. But, because Jesus has already said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go make disciples. So now here's the power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, even my martyrs, in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the utter, utter ends of the earth. And as we see Pentecost starting, we see that the gospel is being preached in Jerusalem, and we also see how the gospel is going to be spread to the utter ends of the earth, because there are people there from all tongues and tribes and nations. And the Spirit makes Himself known by this wind sound, right? Tempest sound. If you watched the movie, you heard Him kept doing it. I'll do it this way. And then you saw also what appeared to be flames of fire, tongues of fire landing upon each of them. And they prophesied. They told about God's goodness, His love. They told about Jesus, this one called Jesus. In the movie, you kept going back to the fact that Peter and Paul and, and uh, Stephen, they, they just couldn't keep telling about this Jesus, this Jesus. Do you tell others about Jesus? Is it something that comes up in your conversation all the time? It should. <laughs> the other day I was talking to a neighbor and asking him a question, neighbor out here, and he started talking to me about Jesus. And I was like, yes, that's just so wonderful. Now, he knew that I was a pastor, but everyone that knows you should know that you're a Christian. They should know you go to church. They should know that you're a Christian in your workplace, at school, wherever it is. They should know it by your love. You will be known to be Jesus' disciples by the way you love one another. Not your knowledge, certainly not your hypocrisy, not because you get mad or get even or anything else, but because you love. Unconditional. Even those that persecute you and you pray for them. Because it's God's will and it'll be your will if you're in tune with His Spirit that all men might be saved. Jesus' first words through the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. And remember, He said before, it is not for you to know the times and seasons, but here we go, in the last days, so you do know some of this, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my manservants and maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Those days are still here. They haven't changed. Jesus Christ hasn't returned. His spirit is on each and every one who has believed, who has been born again. Are you prophesying? Hey, you might even be seeing visions and dreams and everything. But if you're not plugged into that power, that drill's not going to turn, is it? And the hole's not going to get drilled in the wood that you need to build the project that you're building. And guess what? We're building the kingdom of God. Are you plugged into the power, first of all, and are you using that power to build God's kingdom? Are you more worried about the things of this world? You're being distracted. None of the things that you're worried about in this world are going to matter in eternity. For the kingdom of God is eternal. And those loving acts of kindness and those telling about Jesus are eternal. It's not up to you to save them, but you are privileged to be the agent where you can tell them about Jesus Christ and you can show them compassion and love. Because even as enemies, we were enemies when Christ died for us. We looked at Peter's words, and I want to look some more at Paul's words today. And if you saw the video again, you'll see, you will we'll understand where I'm going. But I didn't take this from the video, because <laughs> I didn't watch it first. One of the things that he tied into the video was Paul's letter in Corinth, which you read about Paul's missionary journeys and everything in the book of Acts. But I want to read you some from Paul's letter to Corinth, because that was a church that's messed up. And you know what? All churches are messed up. Throw rocks at me if you want to. You know why they're messed up? 
because we're a bunch of messed up people. We're sinners saved by grace. And this is in 1 Corinthians, which if you know anything about Corinthians, is not actually the first letter to Corinth. It's a second letter to Corinth. And it's written because there's a lot of problems in the church. And the main problem in the church is there's a lack of unity. And if we all are born of the Spirit, we have the mindset of Christ, we should have unity in our mission that what matters the most, period, is spreading the kingdom of God telling others about Jesus Christ. And we've got to live holy lives if that's going to be the case. We've got to get rid of the sin out of our lives and out of the church. And we've got to live for Jesus and tell others about. But they were so much sin in the church, they were so much competing in the church, that they would never ever get their mission done. So Paul writes this letter based off of that division. But I don't want to look at it as a dividing point. I want to look at what Paul says, just like in the book of Acts, the total mission of the church. So I'm just going to read selected scripture. If you want to try to follow along, you can. I'm reading from the Berrien Study Bible. You always ask me that. And I'll try to tell you what verses I'm on. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7 through 10. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift, none, as you eagerly await the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will come, everything will be revealed. He will sustain you to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree together, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be united in mind and conviction. Verse 17 of chapter 1. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Sometimes we think we can't speak these words, but as you are in tune with the Holy Spirit, He gives you the words to speak again. As you're praying, God knows your prayers. He, you've made your request known to Him. He wants to answer your prayers. He works through prayers. As you're reading His Word, it will come alive in you. The Spirit will reveal you into all truth. So if you're studying and prepared just like the people were at Pentecost, don't be surprised if you don't see something mighty happen. Verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are per- perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Verse 26. Brothers, consider the time of your calling. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly and despised things of the world and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast in His presence. It is because of Him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption. Well, I guess I am fit for this mission then, aren't I? (laughs) 1 Corinthians 2, verse 4. My message and my preaching were not with persuasive words or wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith would not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Verse 9, As it is written, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor heart has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed it to us by the Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of man except his own spirit within him? So too no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. And this is what we speak, not in words taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. You've got to be plugged in. You've got to be searching. You've got to be seeking God. He will reveal Himself to you. You've got to be reading God's Word. You've got to be gathering together in prayer. And don't be surprised if the power doesn't come flowing through you. Verse 14, The natural man does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man judges all things, but he himself is not subject to anyone's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? 
but we have the mind of Christ. Chapter 3, starting in verse 13. His workmanship will be evident, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will prove the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as if through the flames. Do you not know that you yourself are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Chapter 4, starting in verse 1. So then, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Now it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. I care very little, however, if I am judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not vindicate me. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to life what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motive of men's heart. At that time each will receive his praise from God. Do we live this way? Are we living like these words? Do you understand that the Spirit, He lives inside of you, that you have a mission? That everything else in this world is rubbish, as Paul says, is garbage, is, is, is compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Him. And the Spirit will guide you into all truth. Now, for a couple chapters here, Paul has to go in and talk about the sin in the church. <laughs> because we've got to get past that sin so that we can be used of God. But I'm not going to go focus on that. I'm going to focus on what he's saying that the church should be like and that you're equipped with every spiritual gift and power out there to do your mission. Chapter 6, starting in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Or don't you know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a, a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. Jumping to chapter 9, verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to take the prize. Everyone who competes in the games trains with strict discipline. They do it for a crown that is perishable, but we do it for a crown that is imperishable. Therefore I do not run aimlessly. I do not fight like I am beating the air. No, I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself might not be disqualified. Chapter 10, starting in verse 1. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank from the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, for they were struck down in the wilderness. That means dead if you didn't catch that. Chapter 12, starting in verse 4. There are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different ways of working, but the same God works all things in all people. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between spirits. To another speaking in various tongues. And still another the interpretation of tongues. All these, work, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit. Who apportions them to each one as he determines. Verse 27, Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a member of it. 
And in the church, God has appointed, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then workers of miracles, and those with gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various tongues. And remember, Paul's writing this to a church many years after Pentecost and the same gifts he's talking about. Are all of you apostles? No. Are all of you prophets? Are all of you teachers? Do all of you work miracles? Do all of you have gifts of healing? Do all of you speak in tongues? Do all of you interpret? But eagerly desire the greater gifts, and now I will show you the most excellent way. In spite, despite, whatever word you want to use, these spiritual gifts that they have that are remarkable miracles, Paul says the most excellent way is to love. Oh, I think Jesus told us that. You will be known by the way you love one another. And a new commandment I give you to love one another. Wait a minute, that's not new. Yes, it is because I'm telling you to love them the way I loved you. To give up your life to save them. That the things of this world you don't chase after anymore because they're rubbish, they're garbage. Garbage. You chase after living by the Spirit, bringing glory and honor to God. Worshiping in spirit and truth. Thinking of others over yourself. <laughs> Even learning to love your enemies. Chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but don't have love, I am only a ringing gong and a clanging cymbal. It's so sad that so much of the church is in division still about these words of Paul. They still think if you don't speak in tongues, you don't have the Spirit or this or that. Paul said, if I do. The point here is if I do but don't have love, I'm just noise. The point is not whether you speak in tongues or not or which tongue you speak in or if you can speak in tongues of angels. The point is the most excellent way, love. I always say it this way, and people laugh at me and think I'm dumb. If I could speak in the language of Ford truck, would the truck listen to me? That's irrelevant. If I could speak in tongues of angels, you know, angels don't have lips. They're spiritual beings. Paul was saying, don't miss my point. Paul was saying the most excellent way is love. That's what he says here. So don't get caught up in the other things. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, which no man will, and all knowledge, and I have absolute faith so as to move mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and exult in the surrender of my body, but have not love, I gain nothing. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? Verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no account of wrongs. Love takes no pleasure in evil, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. You know, when we get to heaven, we won't need the gift of prophecy anymore. <laughs> we will be in the presence of God. Where there are tongues, they will be restrained. Where there is knowledge, it will be dismissed. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, well, when the perfect comes, the partial passes away. When I was a child... I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I set aside childish ways. Now we see but a dim reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. Chapter 14, verse 1. Earnestly, earnestly pursue love and eagerly desire spiritual gift. But if you don't have love, it doesn't matter what gift that you think you have. On that day, many cried out, Lord, Lord, did we not do mighty miracles in your name? 
But Jesus said, Depart from me, I did not know you. Do you have love for God? Do you love Him with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength? And do you love your neighbor as yourself? Chapter 14, verse 39. So my brothers, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything must be done in proper and orderly manner. Chapter 15, verse 19. If our hope in Christ is for this life alone, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in his own turn. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Sounds a lot like what Peter preached. Sounds a lot like what Paul preaches later when he starts spreading the word to the utter ends of the earth in Acts. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Praise God. Chapter 16, verse 13 and 14. Be on alert. Stay firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. Do everything in love. It's kind of how the storyteller went. He told the book of Acts and then went into love. Because as a church, as a church we see in Acts, as Christians, as believers, as children of God, we've got to love. And the only way we can love is to know God who is love. Because He first loved us, we can tell that to anyone that we encounter when the opportunity comes. It's not our job to save them, for them to understand anything else, but to tell them of the hope that we have in love. <coughs> And they should see it in our lives. So back to Acts chapter 2 and the sermon that the Holy Spirit gave Peter that day. He says in verse 33, Exalted then, this is Jesus, to the right hand of God, He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear, the promise. There will be a day when men, women, slave, free, will have the Spirit of God poured out upon them and they will prophesy. They will tell of the good news of Jesus Christ because God has brought reconciliation, salvation to mankind through this man named Jesus. And that's what the, the storyteller kept saying. Whenever Paul got here, whenever you get here, whatever, you don't have the words to say, you just start talking about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And the problem is, see, is religion puts everything else in with Jesus. Jesus plus, or Jesus not even in there. There are other ways or anything. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And he also said, you'll be known by your love. And he also said, I will send the promised Holy Spirit. I will be with you. God himself living in you. Do you have the Holy Spirit living in you? Verse 34, For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. You're either a friend of Jesus, a brother, a son of God, a child of the Most High, or you're still an enemy of God because your sin debt has not been paid because you don't believe in Jesus. Therefore, let all Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and asked Peter and the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Because with this process of believing, there has to be a change if the Spirit's come upon you. You have to realize that you are required to do something. Your, your works of righteousness don't save you. But if you are saved, then the Spirit lives in you 
and is changing you, transforming you, just like a caterpillar into a butterfly. You will be doing something unless you're like the thief on the cross and don't have a chance to because your life's taken that very day. But if not, then your life was purchased, his was too, bought with a price, and you have an obligation to God to live as his child if you are in fact his child. Verse 38, Peter replied, Repent, change your mind, changes your heart, changes your direction, you turn back to God, turn from your sins, turn from living a life to your own where you pray God's will be done and his kingdom come. Pray to the things that were important to you before, or you turn from that to the things that are important heavenly, that, that uh, God's will be done on heaven as in earth. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise belongs to you and your children and to all who are far off, to all whom the Lord will. God will call himself. I just feel like personally, I'll throw the personally in, that the Spirit is not in power in the church today in this country as it should be. And there's no fault in that except our own. I hope today you'll go back and look more and look at what the believers were like when the Holy Spirit came upon them and what they're like when the Holy Spirit came upon them. Before the Holy Spirit, they were anticipating, waiting, eager, desiring, fearing God and desiring His kingdom come, even though they didn't understand it, anything else. They were gathered together, even though they were in fear. They didn't, they didn't run and leave. They were praying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. And then when the Spirit did come, because they were doing these things, and because all the people were gathering together, then they even got to the point where they loved, where they even sold things that they have because they considered them not their own so that there was not anyone in need. There were people in need prior. I mean, that's implied. But after the Holy Spirit came, there weren't any people in need because I loved others more than I loved myself. I thought about their needs. I didn't live myself for my, my life for myself anymore. I lived it for the glory of God because His Spirit is in me, changing me, teaching me, helping me to understand God's love. And the more that I listen to Him, the more that I praise God for His love. How could He love a sinner such as I? With many other words, verse 40, Peter testified and he urged them, Be saved from this corrupt generation. Pull yourself out of it. Don't live the way you were before. Christians are called to be different, holy, loving, living for God. <clears throat> and 3,000 were saved that day and added to the church. That's 3,120 if you do your math. And all of them filled with the Holy Spirit. So what, day, what did that day look like? And there will come a day when Jesus claims His bride or puts His enemies under His footstool. That day looked like this, Acts 2, verse 42 through 47. Six verses. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Devoted themselves to it. Didn't gather here and there. Didn't happenstance it. A sense of all then came over everyone. And the apostles performed many wonders and signs. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they shared with anyone who was in need. With one accord, they continued to meet daily in the temple courts. That's being exposed. And to break bread from house to house, sharing their meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now don't miss this point either about meeting in the temple courts. That means they were going out and open where before they were in locked doors fearing. They were praying and everything, but they were in the upper room scared. Now they're going out in public and they don't care what the Sadducees or Pharisees do to them. Because why fear man who can destroy the body? Fear God who can destroy soul and the body. They had to tell of the good news, even if it cost them their lives. 
because they were cut to the heart because the Spirit of God came upon them. And this promise is for you, for your children, your grandchildren, and your great-grandchildren. Mm. Look how they were changed. Look how they lived their lives. Look how they saved themselves from this corrupt generation. And they were ushering in the kingdom of God, and God added to their numbers daily. Let me remind you of Jesus' words, which is the mission of the church. Peter's words first. Acts 2.32, God has raised this Jesus to life, to which we are all witnesses. A witness testifies to what he knows. Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utter, utter ends of the earth. Matthew 28, 18-20, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commands. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you also must love one another. By this. Everyone that will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Do you believe these words? Is this your mission? Is this our mission as a church? Jesus also said in Matthew 6, 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's kind of the theme of our vacation Bible school, right, Kim? Buried treasure. What's it called? What's the name of it? We haven't even told the church. Do you remember right off? I know it's not that. That's why I messed you up. Something digging. digging. Uh, I'll look it up in the yeah, <laughs> she'll tell you in just a second. Because we hope to, and you you will want to be a part of that, is we want to bring about the thought process that these children that you've got to, you know, when something's valuable that you need to search a little bit for it. But if you do, you'll find it, and it's a better treasure than you can ever compare to anything earthly. And that treasure is Jesus. God making His reconciliation to mankind because He loves you so much that He sacrificed His Son to die for your sins so that you could be a child of God. And we'll plant those seeds and where they go, they go. It's a treasure hunt. Digging for truth. <clears throat> so... Do you know who Mary Oliver is? Boy, you guys don't know much. I didn't either. <laughs> but she's a Pulitzer Prize winner, poet in modern days. It just died recently. I didn't know who she was. I saw a quote from her, and I was like, that's interesting. She was an American poet that was inspired by nature. That's what inspired her, what inspires you. She was inspired by nature rather than the human world. Now, that's what inspires most people, isn't it? So she lived her life and wrote passionately about this in her poetry, which would lead her to winning the Pulitzer Prize. She wrote some poems about God, never anything about being a witness for Jesus. She didn't claim any religious denomination or anything. She wrote this, the most powerful, the most, sorry, I'll start over. The most regretful people on earth are those who felt the call to creative work, who felt their own creative power. I gave you somebody else's power to consider. Who felt their own creative power restive and uprising and gave to it neither power nor time. Now, she comes from a worldly point of view. But all these words of Jesus, all this anticipation in the church, all the results that you see from the church, because the power of God lives in you, restive and uprising. 
wanting to fulfill the kingdom, wanting to usher in the kingdom. And are you giving it power? Giving Him. Let me change that. Are you giving Him power in your life? Are you giving Him time? If you're not plugged in, the drill don't work. Jesus said in Mark 8, 36 to 38, What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. Forbes magazine says there are five stages for living your life passionately. The stages are having a job, but giving your passion neither power or time. Something similar to what Mary Oliver said. These are worldly views. Because people realize they've got one life to live. They need to live it. Having a job and giving your passion time. Having a job and giving your passion both power and time. Quitting your job to give your passion power and time. Sometimes the way we think our life needs to be changed. We need to repent and turn to God. And work for His kingdom. And the last one was building your empire using your passion. How about from a biblical point of view, building the kingdom of God by the power of the Holy Spirit and do it passionately by giving Him power and time in your life and then seeing results. And these promises are for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. God will complete all of His promises. He is doing so with or without you. The Holy Spirit is doing it. There will be a day when Christ comes, and for some it will come as a thief in the night. If you believe, then you'll be working for that kingdom so that when Jesus comes and claims His bride, you will be spotless, blameless, ready to meet Him. John 3, 8 the wind blows wherever it pleases. The word is pneuma. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. John 3, 8. That's John 3, 8, just so you know it. John 3, 8. Contemplate on that. Because this is what Jesus is saying to this religious leader. It looks like he's got it all figured out. But he hasn't come from the darkness into the light. He will not see the kingdom of heaven, Jesus says. John 3, 8. The wind, the Holy Spirit, blows wherever it pleases. You hear His sound, but you can't tell where, it comes, where He comes from or where He is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Can you see wind? Can you? No. No. Can you hear wind? Trick question. No, you can't. No, you cannot. Without an object, you cannot hear wind. You cannot see wind. You see the results of wind. You cannot hear wind unless it is bouncing off an object. Walt shaking his head, so I know I'm right. Wind makes no sound until it passes through or comes in contact with an object. On a windy day, a multitude of sounds can be heard. just like spiritual gifts. One of the most prominent sounds you'll hear is something like whistling. Some will sound like objects falling, rolling, being blown around. Some will be objects rubbing together, you and I. There are three main co contributions to each of the sounds. Friction, as the wind moves across the object, and I choose not to let be blown away. Okay, Falling, because it has blown me away already, and I'm rolling. And rubbing, because I have been blown away and I'm rubbing against you. 
and you're rubbing against me. Now I'm going to read that verse again. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Oh, my prayer is, and this is how I'm going to close so you know it, is blow, Spirit, blow. Blow upon me, blow upon you, blow upon this church. Blow as a result upon our children and our grandchildren. Blow on Bonner's Ferry. Blow on North Idaho. Blow, blow, blow to the ends of the earth until Jesus Christ returns. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you for you are worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Thank you for Jesus and his obedience, for giving up heaven to come to die for me, to not have a place to lay his head, for bringing about the words of Scripture to light where there's such clarity to let me know that you love me so that I can love others as well. Father, help me not to think of my own things, but to think of others' needs over. To know that everything that I have has been given from you and that you love those who richly give. Father, I pray for my children and grandchildren, for the children and grandchildren of each and every one here. I pray for those that are far away, those that are near. I pray for those that are enemies. I pray that you break down the walls, that you break down their hearts. And I pray that Jesus Christ is ushered into this world to reign. I thank you and praise you for all of your promises, for you are faithful and true. And I, and I hope everyone here, will stand on your promises. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring.